Hello, hello, and welcome back from the lunch break. We are here yet again to do another two-hour block, and we have some wonderful guests here in the studio with us uh, all about Lake Country, LC Power Tools. You may have seen the name, so here's a look at what we have coming up. Obviously, this morning we had IK Sprayers and Color Lock with a great break down there, followed by our lunch break. And now that we're back, we're going to be touching on that LC Power Tools and Lake Country. So first up, let's take a look at what LC Power Tools has to offer. That was amazing. So, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, we've got David Patterson and Andrew Wilson of Lake Country uh, Manufacturing and LC Power Tools. And in this next two hours, we're going to be doing a little bit of both. Today, uh, for this first part, we are going to be talking about the yes. new Udos, the new Udos pads, and uh, everything that has to do with LC Power Tools. And then we'll move on. Uh, after that, we'll probably go to a little commercial break and then we'll move into uh, some of the hot pad talk, as I like to call it, you know. But thank you guys for being here. Thanks so, for having us. Yeah, not a problem. So what do we got? Tell me all about this machine. Well, we've got a lot. You want to start? Yeah, I'm just going to kind of back up and uh, thank you guys for hosting such a great event. Yeah. Um, we appreciate everybody tuning in and this is like an amazing opportunity just to share off some of the new innovations that are coming into the marketplace. So, um, as you can see here, we have a couple demo units of the UDOS, and UDOS stands for User Defined uh, Orbital Stroke Orbital Stroke Polisher. And, and what it is, is uh, we'll kind of take a step back and, and talk about all the different tools that we've been able to incorporate into a, a tool like this. And if you think about, you know, many, many years ago, really, we only had rotary polishers. And in the last 15 years or so, uh, there's been a big shift and, and different tools have come into the marketplace. And what we've done is we kind of created um, a tool that can house multiple different uh, functions. And I'll pass it off to Dave so you can kind of get into um, a little bit of the background of the tool and then kind of some of the other components of that. Um, so if you're going to try to use it in the near future, uh, you can definitely understand a quick way of putting it together. Yeah, so this tool started years ago, actually, with um, an idea from our vice president. Um, he came into the office one day with a, a piece of wood with some plastic gears on it, and he said, I got an idea, and this is what we're going to do. Um, and that was the beginning of what was the idea of the UDOS. Um, originally, we had looked at how we could adjust the orbital stroke of the machine anywhere from you know 8 or, or 6 all the way up to 21 millimeter machines as the dual action polisher market seems to continue to grow. Right. Um, like Andrew said, you know, 15 years ago, uh, the rotary tool was the most predominantly used tool in the industry, whether it was body shop or detailing. 
Um, and as the dual action polisher began to be used uh, more and more, um, we hit the next evolution or phase of what dual action, dual action polishing is um, with long stroke or long orbit tools that came in the market maybe five, six years ago, or at least for the most of us. Um, so the UDOS really tries to grasp all the different tasks, all the different tools, and all the different things that you would need to do as a detailer or as somebody in the body shop and put them all into one tool. Um, as much as the market has shifted away from rotary polishing for the most part, we've seen a, a new wave of rotary polisher users um, and different ways that people are utilizing the different styles of polishers, whether they, they use one style of tool or whether they're doing a, a combination, like a, a multi-tool. Um, so the perfect example is um, you know, cutting with a rotary tool and then finishing with a DA, which is, which is a sample or an example that we'll we'll share in a little bit here. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, it's taking taking all of those things and putting it into one tool. Um, it really, really caters to, I mean, anybody in the market. But people that are mobile detailing, huge value. Um, body shop, huge value. Um, anywhere where you're using multiple things or you have to carry around multiple tools. I think that's where you get the hugest advantage. But um, just being able to switch between orbits to adjust to uh, um, the size of a panel or mm -hmm. a contour or, or what the task is that you're trying to do is, is also huge. Um, along with the development of the tool during that process, we did a lot of um, questionnaires, a lot of surveys, getting feedback from end users, and trying to develop all of the other things that come together with it, like the handles and the backing plate. You want to tell us a little bit about the backing plates? Yeah, so um, actually before I jump into the backing plates, yeah, no I kind of want to open up kind of the uh, ins and outs of oh, essentially no. the, uh, the tool in itself. So a lot of the technology is embodied in the tool. And uh, we've had a couple customers uh, kind of turn on the tool and the tool's not working appropriately right. And so um, very, very briefly, we have instructions on there. And we have a really, really nice flyer, um, which is a quick start guide in order to do what um, you want to do, but in order for the tool to work appropriately, you do need to put on the backing plate first. And the backing plate comes with the tool itself, and then there comes a little Allen wrench on here, and it's specifically tailored toward uh, our tool. So I'll kind of go ahead and show you guys how to do this. And it's uh, well before we even toss it on. Okay. Um, as as people have seen um, throughout the launch of our tool um, at SEMA and Mobile Tech, um, we've done a lot of videos and um, pictures of the machined uh, components inside the polisher about how, how precision it is and, and how advanced it is. Um, with the development and, and the production models, what we did is we actually went and coated all of these materials. Um, a lot of times when you see if you're um, in a hot, humid environment, whether you live down in Georgia or, or somewhere like that, or if you use your polisher with a pad washer, anything that would expose your polisher to moisture or water, um, a lot of these internal components rust really fast. So one of the things that we did from from the models that you've seen in the past before our launch was um, done coatings on the internal components. And we've tested like a number of metals as well to make sure that the counter rate is like appropriate. So I'll kind of finish off here and then I'll uh, let Dave dive into um, just the backing plate and some of the components about the backing plate and what makes that really unique. Yeah, so the, just like Andrew said, um, utilize the quick start guide um, and the QR codes on the back for any of the videos or any of the instructions that you need while setting up your polisher. Um, we've had a number of people not use the quick start guide and um, have some issues. Currently the machine only comes with a five inch backing plate. Um, it does not fit other backing plates and is designed to use, use specifically the UDOS backing plate. Um, so I will recommend um, when you buy your polisher, do not attempt to put another backing plate on there. We've had some of those issues. Um, the backing plate is, is a really cool design uh, because it uses NACA ducts. Mm -hmm. And if you're a car person, you know what NACA ducts are, or, or you've at least seen them. Um, they promote airflow. Um, and our design actually proves to create pressure with our design to cool the backing plate and to cool the back of the pad. Um, so just like some of the other ventilated backing plates you see on the market, ultimately it's being utilized the same way. Um, we're just doing it in a different concept and we're, we're gathering air from the circumference of the, the disc in order to cool the backing plate, to create pressure inside the backing plate and cool it. Now I will say, after using this, that backing plate is seriously one of my favorite features of this entire machine. 
get rid of all the other five things, that backing plate is revolutionary. Yep. Because uh, er when I was using it, my pad stayed so much cooler than what I've been used to. And that was, I was blown away. Because the, you know, you're working on a panel, you, you know, you stop and you go to blow off your pad. Like, there are times you can feel the heat oh, coming yeah. off that pad or you see steam, especially as it gets colder out, maybe work in your garage or something. You can see the steam because of the temperature change. But I, it, it, was, it was wild to go to touch that pad and have it be room temperature. Oh, especially when you're like, peeling them off too. Right, you know? that too. That was, I mean, because that's, that's crazy. So it really, the, in, the engineering that went into that backing plate is absolutely insane. Yeah, and I refer to it kind of like a race car because I like race cars. But, but, I, but the reality of it is most of the um, design features of this tool actually came from um, airplanes. The, the airplanes, the, you know, the aero industry. Um, our vice president is an aeronautical engineer. Um, he's a, a hobbyist when it comes to airplanes. Um, he, he works on his own planes and um, he's just a really talented guy. And a lot of these things um, that he developed in conjunction with our engineer in-house um, are really based off of, off of airplanes. Um, the whole idea of the changing unit for, for changing from eight millimeter to 21 millimeter or just the variety of orbits is based on um, how airplanes are balanced. Mm -hmm. So the, the initial concept came up of, of just from aero in general. So um, just like the machine, the backing plate design is, is based off that as well. NACA ducts are widely used in airplanes and things like that. Um, and you can see throughout the polisher all the little little airplane quirks mm -hmm. that go through <laughs> it. So, um, so the other neat thing about um, the Udo's polisher is that it's, it's catered to any type of user. And one of those things is the variety of different handles that we offer. Um, doesn't matter what size, you, what size hand you have, um, how you like to hold the polisher, um, we have a handle that's for you. The one that we're showing right here on the machine is, is the standard handle. This is the handle that you're going to find when you buy the Udos machine. Um, it only does come with one handle. It comes with this standard size handle, but we have two different options. We have one that's our small option. Um, this is going to be a little bit universal. Um, for people that have smaller hands or just like to cup the front of the machine. Um, and then we also have our larger handle, um, which is more of like a duck bill type of a thing. Um, and this is for anybody that's got really, really large hands. Um, I personally thought that this was kind of interesting when we first came out. It's, it looks rather large. When you get it in your hand, it, it feels amazing. And I don't even have that big a hand. So I can only imagine, you know, the, the people that are six feet tall or plus that have, you know, pretty big hands. Um, this is going to be crucial and, and a really nice piece to have to customize and um, create the polisher to work the best for you. Awesome. Yeah. I didn't even know those were available. That's, the, that's even cooler. So yeah. really true customization. Yeah, it's, it's a true customization piece and um, really kind of make it your own. Everybody knows how many people modify their polishers mm -hmm. when they buy them um, brand new, whether it's recommended or not. And, um, and this is kind of our you know, factory modification program, if, if you'll say. So, do um, you have anything else that you wanted to say about the, um, the handles of the backing plates? I don't have anything to add. Um, yeah, you can, wherever you're gonna purchase your Udos, they'll carry those, uh, they'll, they'll carry those handles. Um, so that's where you'll be able to get a different set of handle if you wanna try it, because all the machines will just come with the medium standard handle. Yeah, yeah. So, One of the well, things also that I was gonna say about the backing plate that you guys didn't touch on is the reference marks. Yeah. That's, you know, normally we're always drawn, we're taking a Sharpie and we're drawn on the backing plate, putting in our own marks or hash marks uh, to, and that's for rotation. Yeah. So the, the, the marks in the backing plate are what we call stall aware and it helps you identify when the backing plate is stalled. Um, but it's also utilized to um, know what position the backing plate is when you're changing the orbits. And I think that's a good segue into um, how does the machine work and, and how do you change between an eight, 12, 15, or 21 millimeter orbit. And then how else do you put, it, put that into its rotary function as well? So the, the gear ring or dial out here is gonna tell you what position that you can, uh, or what position that you're in. If you look on the nose, um, all of these lines need to be um, all lined up in order to change. So what we look at is our upper collar that tells us what gear we're in. Um, we take our lower collar and line that up and that will then allow us to change the gears and change between orbits. 
I can do it over here if you yeah. just want to keep talking. Yeah, so if you see right here, we're, we're in rotary function, and this is where it becomes a little bit more important to have the backing plate lined up. So the third line that you would line up is the backing plate, and the only time that that is necessary is when you're going in or out of rotary. Um, because rotary has a locked center point, unlike a dual action polisher, um, when you line up these lines, it allows it to unlock and change into the dual action mode. So as you can see right here, the, the backing plate is locked because it's in its rotary function. We're gonna line the line up, and I'll let Andrew get it just perfect. And then what you'll do is you'll pull down on the collar and move it out. Now what that's done is it's changed this machine from a rotary polisher into an eight millimeter orbit. Um, it's unlocked the center bearing, so it has a true dual action, and it's ready to be switched into any of the dual action modes, whether it's sanding or one of the polishing functions. Um, P1 is our 12 millimeter function. P2 is a 15 millimeter function, and P3 is a 21 millimeter function. So whether you're utilizing the polisher as a, um, an, as a one type of a tool, if you're using just a, a 15 or a 21 um, for a specific car, or if you're doing a, tool, a dual action process where you might cut with a rotary or cut with a 21, and then come back and refine or finish with a 12 millimeter, um, the tool is ready to do whatever you need. Um, so like I said, Unlike the rotary where you need to line up the backing plate, whenever you're changing between functions, the only thing that's necessary is to line up the lower collar and the upper collar um, before changing. When changing in between orbits, um, one of the things we always recommend is making sure that the collar has gone back up and engaged. So as you can see, we're in sanding or eight millimeter mode. We're gonna push the collar down and we're gonna turn it over to 12 millimeter. If the collar is not fully up and you can see the metal here, that will cause issues if you try to engage the machine. So the, the most crucial part about operating this tool is to make sure your collar is, is locked up. Yeah, um, we've, and we've put a spring in here just to make sure that it, you'll feel the whole collar push down and then come right back up. Yep. And if you're not feeling that, um, you, you really actually have to put a little bit of force when it's a brand new machine and then it'll pop right back into place. Yeah, the springs can be a little stiff on the first couple of uses. Um, so just to be aware, um, in order for the collar to come down even, um, we needed to design a spring system that would keep everything straight, and it's a little bit stiff. So the first couple of uses are, are kind of the break-in period. You just gotta make sure all the, the markings are lined up just right. Yeah, um, tell me a little bit, I know people will have questions. Now, tell me a little bit about the rotary, the sanding, P1, P2, P3, and kind of the the thought process behind that. Yeah, so initially when we um, looked at the tool, it was a dual action tool, um, but then we started realizing how important the rotary function was. Um, rotary polishers have become a little bit more popular in the last year or two. Um, I think people still find a, a need in using them, um, and it's, it's ultimately important if we want to be somewhat relevant in, in the body shop. Yeah. Um, but rotary polishers are still widely used in the body shop, and this gives it a way for maybe the technician or even the shop that is familiar with rotary polishers to be able to um, adjust their process, so still continue on with that, that rotary cutting process, make it efficient and easy um, where they know that they're not losing time, and then still be able to get that, that premium finish without holograms and swirls that yeah. every body shop or most body shops are kind of known for. Um, so this is a good tool for, for that type of a, a use. Um, the other thing is we just find a, a variety of people um, in the industry where they like different orbits. Mm -hmm. you know, I think everybody likes different orbits, um, whether you're a predominantly long throw polisher user or you're just a standard DA user. Um, I've always been a huge fan of a 21 millimeter, even though it seems to be like a 15 or a 12 is a little bit more popular. Um, 21 millimeter polishers do make it difficult to polish into concaved areas. They do make it difficult into you know, polishing into confined areas where the the bagging plate orbit might just be a little bit too right. long where it feels a little bit dangerous. Um, so that's why we have uh, uh, multiple different orbit, stri orbit strokes. And then um, what we noticed is globally, um, sanding was predominantly done with pneumatic polishers or pneumatic sanders. And they still are a lot in the, in the US. Um, but as we look at the global trend and, and everything, how it's changing, um, there's a lot more electric sanding being done in body shops. Hmm. Um, and I think that's a transition from 
um, potentially going cordless, you know. Um, so there's a lot of advantages in into using electric sanders, um, depending on how the shop's laid out. Um, but ultimately, it's, fi it's five functions. You have your rotary for your heavy cutting. Um, we have our 21 millimeter, which, you know, a lot of people use for for heavy cutting out of the orbital polishers, it's gonna be the most efficient and mm -hmm. the most effective, at least on a flat panel. Um, and that's gonna be um, your most effective cutting tool um, in a DA option. The 15 millimeter is gonna be the kind of the go-to. Um, I think a lot of detailers in the industry right now, um, the most popular is a 15 millimeter orbit. So it's gonna be the kind of like the standardized orbit that people use. Um, but we do see a lot of people that love 12 millimeter polishers for finicky paint or for tighter, smaller areas. Um, 12 millimeter polishers can help reduce the amount of haze or micromarring that you might see on some of these softer paints or some of these single stage paint or custom, you know, custom paint jobs. Um, so really the, the functions are all there for mainly the type of paint you're working on, the type of panel you're working on, um, and then how confined your area is and what you're really trying to do. Um, I personally, even cut most of the time with the DA polisher these yeah, days. That's me too. Um, I only use a rotary when I need to. Um, but the advantage is if you're doing sanding, wet sanding, or you have really heavy defect removal, the rotary tool is typically the most effective and efficient tool for that. Well, and I, so I utilize just dual action polishers now almost exclusively. Yep. And I haven't really picked up a rotary for home use mm -hmm. in a very, very long time. And when I took this home and used it over a weekend and played on a car with it, I found just having that rotary option to be able to work a scratch out a little quicker helped immensely. Yep. Because it was like, man, I'm not really getting any, anywhere. And I stopped, switch pads, change it over to rotary, hit my compound again, just burp, 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 hit that scratch. And it'd be done. And I go, oh, swap pads, flip it back out, put it to 15 and uh, finish it out. And it was the fact that I had it available had it. Yep. all of a sudden without having to go, uh, like normally I would be thinking, okay, what tool do I need to bring home from work to work this weekend? But, cause I have a 15 and a 21 DA and they, they do everything basically that I need, but having that rotary option, I was surprised how much I used it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing, it, it, it's changed the way that I um, detail cars as well. I'm similar to you. I came from the collision repair industry. Yep. I we were trained on rotary. Only rotary, nothing. Yeah. Um, so for me, I did transition over to DAs. It took me a long time, um, but I do think that they're they're a great tool to use. Uh, you know, nine out of ten times, I'm still using my, yep. my DA. Um, but this tool has given me the opportunity to kind of fall back into the style of polishing that I actually really like. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of changed that because just the convenience, you know. Um, I don't really want to switch pol between polishers unless I absolutely have to. Um, but coming from that rotary market and doing um, specialty cars or, or special cars, um, I really liked a rotary function because of how I can do my edge work. Yeah. You know, I think I think that's the biggest thing. Um, if you get into detailing um, specialty Porsches or or some of these older cars, where I mean, everybody that's detailed enough of them knows. They're all thin if they haven't already been broken through. Right. Half the time you get a you know an 80s, 70s, 911. Um, all the edges and the the drip rails. Uh, you can thin. see yeah you can see the primer. They've already been buffed through. Things like that. So um, the the precision and the control of a rotary polisher is is unmatched by any tool on the market. I think, um, and that's really where where I personally love being able to switch back and forth. So I I love the fact that I am a DA user. I don't typically use use the rotary but I can come in and box in a panel and then I can continue to just change it and go about my way and do my normal process without having to, to focus with my DA work and try to work out all these right. edges where yep. it's hard to get your swirls and scratches out. Yep. Um, I think that's, that's the well, general function of yeah, how the it tool, works. Yeah, the tool, that's one of the things I like is the ability to change, the ability to kick back into rotary. I love that backing plate. Like I said, it actually, it's amazing how much cooler that pad is. But then the pads themselves are specific for this machine, and it's, that's a totally new feature. Yeah, this was a big project for us too, and it was um, it was something that we we completely developed different from any of the foams that we do currently. Um, it was done on a chemistry side, um, but not only just the de development of of the material that's used in the pad, just the idea of the pad line itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's 
everybody that knows Lake Country is we've always specialized in a specific type of pad or a pad line for a type of tool. So right. um, a pad, a pad line is developed by the shape, the thickness, the types of foams to maximize the performance of a of a certain type of tool. Right. Uh, this tool was the exact opposite of that. So um, that was the first challenge, being that you know it it just had to work a little bit differently. It had to work for multiple actions. Right. Um, mul not only multiple orbits, but the multiple actions too. It had to be good on a rotary. Um, but still work on a DA. The other part of it is with the type of tool that it was and, and how it's being used, we also felt like it needed to work for the closure repair market and then it also needed to work for a detailer. So um, because of that, that's one of the reasons why we went with our, our micro wool product. Um, it's not the standard microfiber type pad that's become very, very popular, um, but it resembles that in its overall appearance and how it performs. Um, the micro wool was something that we um, took a lot of time to design actually. It looks similar to things that you'd find in Japan. Mm -hmm. They use a lot of a short short wool fibers and what it is is um, it's kind of like a rotary wool pad um, all shrunk down. Um, if you look at the the small strands or the fibers of yarn essentially what they are is they're, they're pulled out and they're twisted really tight kind of okay. like your old traditional yeah. rotary rotary buffing pad. Right. Um, so it's taking that same idea of your your big eight inch, nine inch wool pad and shrinking it all up down and, and making it work appropriately for a dual action polisher. Yeah. Um, because of the, the density and the way that we've designed the sewing structure into it, um, the one nice thing about this micro wool pad versus other, other wool style products like this is that with a blow gun or a tornador, you can easily blow them out or fluff them up just like a microfiber pad. Okay. Um, that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we've that we've seen when trying to work with natural wool is because they have those um, barbs and um, natural hooks on the fibers, they tend to stick together and mat up and get clogged. Um, so a lot of work was put into the design and, and keeping these fibers spread apart and making it able to be cleaned out multiple times in use, just like a microfiber pad. Yeah, that's, I, I found that the most fascinating. And honestly, these are, so I can remember getting pads first before getting the machine and yeah. I fell in love with these pads. Yeah. These are like, some of my favorite pads in the industry, and uh, that, I, I joke that that's that these and the Rupes Blue Wool is the only <laughs> pads I use, yep. and like it's it's funny, but those are these are definitely my go-tos now. They're well, just so good. They they have kind of become my go-to as well. Um, you know, the wool pad it's it's more than just that. I think. I mean, if you look at microfiber pads, they're definitely the most popular pads on the market, especially for detailers, you know, for some of the best detailers. Um, the performance of microfiber pads is, is very well known where you can see um, the same wave of microfiber pad users going um, global. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we've seen microfiber pads become very, very popular within the last five years here. They're still just becoming popular in, in certain areas of Europe. Right. Um, so. They're, they're making their way, and, and part of that is Europe used a lot of rotary. So they're actually making huge strides on the dual action market too. So, so all these things come in phases. But um, the one thing that we decided with wool is, is that it's not microfiber. Yep. Um, a, a traditional body shop guy is going to have some sort of relation, a guy or woman, um, is going to have some sort of a relation to wool over microfiber. Right. Um, if you haven't used a DA polisher, if you haven't used microfiber, if you've been in the body shop in the industry, and somebody tells you, yeah, you gotta use this microfiber pad, uh, a lot of people think you're a little crazy. Um, it's just not something that they've typically seen. Um, so the wool pad is uh, a little bit more familiar for the collision repair industry. And then the other thing is, is it works great um, for cutting on the DA, but it works awesome for orange peel removal and heavy defect removal on a rotary. Hmm. Um, because it's not microfiber, it doesn't have um, the same sticky, grabby, um, characteristics that you would see from a microfiber on a rotary tool. Um, that's one of the reasons that why they're not commonly used on a rotary. Um, but the wool avoids that. So um, ultimately it's just a, a super universal cutting pad, works for rotary, works for DA, um, works for orange peel removal, for heavy cutting removal if you're doing sand scratches in the body shop, or if you just have a really trashed car. Cool. You have something you wanted to say about that? Um, the only thing I want to add to is I mean, people are going to look at it and say, hey, wh why'd you put a bevel on it and wh what's in it for me? Because um, I know traditional pads, you know, they're a lot, it could be just cut out, right? Yeah. So we've shaped this a little bit, and I know that was one of your ideas. So 
Why don't you tell everybody about that? Yeah, I mean, the tapered, tapered design has become more popular in the last few years. Um, one of the main reasons is when you put it into a 15 or 21 millimeter orbit, uh, the tapered design prevents the pad from rolling underneath it. Um, but it also is really nice. It's, it's the perfect um, profile to use on a rotary and still be able to get um, really nice precision edge work where you can see everything you're working on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the biggest things too when people think about, well, when I use a, a rotary wool pad when I'm doing really heavy cutting, you know, sometimes it's really hard to see what I'm doing. You can't see, you know, the, the two inches on yeah, the side right. of the pad um, because there's not a definitive edge. There's not a definitive line. Even when you get into a sheepskin or lamb's wool pad, which is more precise than that traditional one, um, it's still really hard to see. So that's where this pad comes in. Uh, the, the taper allows you to see right to the edge and really manipulate how you use that polisher and, and be able to do that edge work that you need to do. Yeah, okay. that's cool. Dane, is are there any questions before we get into a little demo action? And, you know, I know that was a lot of information for everybody to uh, understand, but I mean, we're this is some, you know, uh, industry changing stuff. No, absolutely. There, there were a handful of ones here. I think a lot of people were just curious to watch. They, they were more like transfixed watching than they were actually asking the questions. But I do have a few. Okay. All right. So what I've got here is, of course, our very own friend of the show, Hans Closen, here asking, Hans. what is the price range for the new Udos in Europe? That'd be a good question. Um, <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna stump us. Sorry, got him. <laughs> yeah, stump him on the first question. Um, can you be a little bit more specific? What I will tell you is, uh, we have a website that's dedicated to our distributors, um, and if you go to lcpowertools.com and kind of pick your location, um, I think that will be the best way to find out what the price point of the tool is in your specific region. This is just so hard to. Uh, Sure. Different currencies and um, freight, etc. But I do, I do have exciting news that these tools are shipping um, overseas right now and into Europe, and so that uh, it's very, very exciting for us. So that would be my my advice. Yep. Okay, excellent. No, makes perfect sense. Now here's an interesting one. You guys kind of touched on it during your explanation of the backing plates. I had a guy here asking. Will there be a three-inch machine in the future? So I understand you had some people who maybe tried to uh, construct their own backing plate and that wasn't the right way to go, but maybe yeah. there's something in the future that could help. That's from Gumi, who's a uh, our RAG company representative in Iceland. Nice. So. Well, yeah, thank you for the question. We, we do have some more um, backing plates in development, but we do also have um, new tools in development. We can't um, share too much about the information on on what those tools are, but, sure. but we have um, we have been working on some future tools. We have been wor working on some future backing plates. Um, so you will see some some new stuff coming from LC Power Tools um, next year in, in 2021 that will help kind of support the things I think I think a lot of people are asking about and are wanting. Nice. Okay. No, that's perfect. I think that's exactly what he was looking for. And then followed up there, I've got another one. Got all the tough ones here. James Wells, he's asking, will there eventually be battery operated for mobile guys? I know this is a common talking point coming up these days. Well, I know that it's been a, a hot topic. Um, I don't know if we've really kind of made a decision on, on when or, or how we want to move into a, a battery powered market. I think battery power is definitely the future. Um, I don't know if, um, I don't know if if most tools in the market are at that phase where no. where we want to be um, with battery power, but I definitely think there's a lot of great ones out there. Um, I, I I would anticipate seeing battery powered tools coming from LC Power Tools coming in the future, um, but it isn't going to be um, it, it isn't actively going to be replacing our current tool. If that gotcha. makes sense. Gotcha. Okay, understood. And uh, I got an easy one here for you. You don't even have to do anything. It's just Scott Barber saying, this is on my Christmas list. So nice. he's got it on the short list there. Well, hopefully awesome. Santa's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, then I go back to the complicated stuff with Grant Hawtrey here. He's a friend of the show. He's in New Zealand. He's asking, are we likely to see a 240-volt version available to the Australasian slash New Zealand market? Yeah, there's that's definitely in... in in line. I'm not sure the dates on that. I know that the European tools just started shipping. There's so many different um, variations, variations of plugs and um, yeah, just well, power and power yeah. electrical approvals that need to go through the, the, the process of B. Yeah, but I assume that you'll 
that Australia will probably see something um, in this calendar year, and, and I would probably assume that it'd be it, coming up in the next six months. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. All right, guys, why don't you go ahead and start doing some demo well, stuff let's, here. Let's I'll pull some in some new comments. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, you want to do demo demo the Udo pads quick over here? Or we yeah, let's uh, let's do a quick demo over here, and then we'll come back and I'll have you explain these a little bit yeah. more, um, and I'll explain how uh, the different processes here are. So I'll invite the camera crew to kind of come see what we're doing over here, and kind of just one. show you kind of the ease of use of the physical tool. So we're going to work on this section over here, and I got a cutting pad okay. right here. You want me to do the pattern yeah. you talk? And I want you guys just to kind of check out the scratches over there. Um, Dave P is going to be in kind of the rotary mode to start off with. Where do you guys want me? Can you see what's going on? Looks like we got a good view of what's going on on the hood there. Yep. So yeah, so we're gonna use the, um, you know, to be honest with you, I don't even know if we need this. Um, GM paint can be a little soft, so I don't know if we need that heavy a cut, but. Do you wanna start with the? Uh, no, we'll, we'll do it, it'll be fine. At least aggressive method. We got the last cut, it's Anthony's favorite, and it finishes really good, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get something going here and the wool won't be too aggressive. GM paint is known for being a little soft, especially the black, um, so it might not necessarily need this heavy of a cut, it's a new pad, so we're gonna prime it a little bit. Now, do you suggest, like, if people are using rotary mode, that you want it primed, don't want it primed? What's, I don't know, is it? So, I, I personally um, am one of the people that isn't super heavy on priming, not because I don't think it's important, I just think that, you know, for most circumstances, the, the pad's gonna end up priming itself. Sometimes are a little bit more important than others, and I think this is probably one of them. Okay. We're doing a, Microfiber and micro wool pads is, is something I typically tend to um, prime a little bit more. Um, just because of all the little fibers, we want to um, get that polish spread out throughout the pad and make sure that it's not dry in any place. Um, but the other thing is we're going to be using this in a rotary function, um, and it has a very short short pile. So the last thing we want to do is create heat by not having a or by having a dry pad and not having enough polish on there. So um, in order to avoid that. I'm going to put a little bit on the pad, put it on the surface, kind of prime the pad before we lay down our bead. Okay. All right. So we'll lay down a little product here. And uh, as much as DA polishers have really taken over the, the market, you know, one of the nice things about a rotary tool is you don't have to have um, the same type of skill that you need to have with a DA polisher in order to curve and do these little pads or have multiple machines. You can adjust how you tilt the polisher and how you use it um, in order to get all these areas when you're doing either your edge work or your initial cutting step. You guys can see here, like there's a little bit of blow off and that's just the first time he's using the pad. So, um, we're starting essentially on speed one, which is a very, very low RPM. And uh, we're just gonna start there and he's gonna check out the defects. So that's running about a thousand RPMs a minute at speed one. So another nice thing about it is, um, before you wipe that off, is you know we're in a rotary function, we're doing a heavy rotary cut. Um, but what's nice about that is we can line everything up. We can switch into our DA mode before we even do our polishing step, and we give it one final pass just to remove any of those holograms. So 
because the rotary action is so aggressive and usually leaves some swirls or hologams behind that DA just helps kind of clean that up. How's it look? I'm going to ask the cameras here. Yeah, you can see definitely you removed um, a lot of those scratches. And then you can see there's a little bit of micro marring there, but that's expected. Well, it's got some lacquer check on it. You know, you can see the lacquer checking in there, but I'm pretty impressed with that overall, especially because, like David's saying, I mean, this is, this is worst case scenario, right? Black yep. GM, that's how it goes. I yeah. feel like we need to get Anthony in here to teach you how to pick up a bead. I didn't spray anybody. <laughs> I got a ten and two. I didn't. Pay, I didn't spray anybody. <laughs> I was. I was feeling it though, kind of coming up. I'm a little short for that yeah, truck. That's all right. That's all right. I think we all are a little short for this truck, but <laughs> yeah, I'm not the only be one. Okay. Well, we might have to put the small hand grip on for Anthony. So. Yep. So um, Dave, when you when you started that in its in its uh, dual action mode, you started at a little bit higher speed, right? Yeah. And so can you kind of walk users through? why you didn't start it at one or two and, and why we recommend starting kind of at a little bit higher speed. Yeah, so on the rotary function, I'm gonna start um, a little bit slower down towards the 900, 1000 mm -hmm. RPM right in the beginning phase. I personally like to polish around 900 to 1200 RPM on a rotary. Most compounds um, recommend 1500. You know, if you look at most bottles, they say 1500. Some of them will say 1200, but that's kind of the go-to range. I polish a little bit slower. So when you're in a rotary mode, you're typically using speeds like one to three um, yeah. for, for the type of speed that you'd want to be using with the rotary. When you get into the dual action modes, um, in order for it to operate properly, you need to be spinning more at like five or six. So um, typically on the rotary side, you're going to use a slower speed. On the DA side, you're going to use a higher speed. Um, dual action polishers spin considerably faster than rotary polishers. Right. Um, so that's one of the things that you need to think about when, when switching back. Well, and and the amount of training that you and myself have done for folks, I, I always, it's a good rule of thumb. If you're playing with the rotary for the first time, low and slow. Yep. Like you're working, you know, like you're smoking meats. Yep. You know, it, you don't want to rush it. And uh, it's easy to remember, you know, low and slow because your arm movements need to be slow. The speed needs to be very low. And to at least get comfortable with the tool, especially if it's your first time. Yeah. You know, get used to the machine. Don't go whole hog and crank it up because one, it's not necessary. And two, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yeah, and it's just a little bit different. I mean, when you're using a, um, a pad with such a, a short pile height, it's not, you know, an inch and a half yeah. fiber that's just kind of laying out and floppy. Right. Um, it has some rigidity behind it. It has some aggressiveness to it. Um, so for me personally, I run it a little bit slower. Um, the pad cuts really, really fast. So yes. um, for me, I can, I can just slow down the speed. I can watch exactly what I'm doing. Um, I can see through the, the polish and, and understand when yeah. I can stop. Yep. So... For this, we're going to switch into the, the DA pad. Um, I suppose we could probably talk about it as we do the demo here. Um, the other two pads are, are going to be a cutting and a polishing pad. Um, the olive is going to be your cutting pad. The khaki is going to be your polishing pad. And both of these utilize the same type of chemistry, which is our active rebound technology. Um, we've been working over the last four years or so with um, development of products to um, fight against the heat that's created mm -hmm. um, during the process. So you see foam pads, they get soft, um, they have failures, there's different issues that happen. Um, but more than just that, we really wanted to make a product that offers consistency. So if I start polishing on this fender, by the time that I finish that door, the pad still feels the same, but not only does it feel the same, it's offering the same result as you go. So right. um, some people don't think about it, they say, oh, the pad got a little softer, it's getting softer. Um, but they don't realize that they're, they're increasing their downward pressure to adjust for that foam pad softening, um, increasing the destructiveness to the pad, and it's just a, a recipe for disaster. So, well, and especially like on other machines where you have a tendency to heat that pad up yep. so much, you know, we've had to say this on multiple Q, uh, Q and A's. People ask how many pads to get around a car. And That's when guys are surprised that, and gals that are surprised that have to do, wait, well, you want me to buy more than one pad? Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, because the amount of destruction and forces from a tool on that pad, they're, they're not going to hold up very long. And if you buy multiples and they can kind of tag out, yep. you know, a tag team in a car for you, you know, it's easier for four of them to get a car done, four pads to do the job rather than one and so, so much easier. your pads will last longer meaning you'll get 
more money out of them because you're able to do more cars, but also it's just going to help you as a detailer in your processes, your polishes, your compounds. They're going to be able to cycle better. Oh yeah, you everything. Know, everything's better. just going to work better. There's yeah, everything. Literally everything will work better, and and I think that's. I mean, everybody likes new pads. I love using new pads. I, I call it new pad day. Yeah, it's a great day. No, it, it's a great day, but but that's the funniest thing is. Um, if you cycle pads like that, they feel new a lot longer. Yeah. Um, I don't pull pads out of my cabinet and like look at them like I, I dread using them because I know they're towards the end and I just want that fresh pad day. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in reality, it, it does make a big difference. So I cycle pads as, as much as I can, um, but I know that not everybody's gonna do that. Um, yeah. They're just either their job doesn't, their production detailing, it's not what they're doing um, or whatever it might be. Um, but that's where you know some of these products come in. So the the, the rebound technology or um, that buoyant effect. You know we we attempted and started that type of product with HDO pads that we'll mm -hmm. talk about over there. Um, but ultimately, it's just kind of trying to keep your pad consistent so that your polishing process is consistent and then your results are consistent. Um, and along with that, the the olive pad is we call it a medium cutting pad. I would say it's a it's a traditional cutting pad. I say that this works really, really great for um, one-step polishing. It works great for light cutting um, on the DA, but it also is is mainly the best for rotary polishing, or I'm sorry, rotary cutting or compounding um, in a body shop setting where wool isn't able to be used. Um, either it's a small shop and they can't let the, the fibers or the dust in the air, um, or whatever the, the reason may be, um, this green pad is gonna be ultimately the best option for those body shops and for those clean shops that can't afford to have that linting. Um, we're gonna skip that pad, this pad through this process. We cut the, cut the paint out with our Udo wool pad. We're gonna come back with our khaki foam polishing pad and we should be able to finish out any of the haze or micromarin that we installed with our wool pad. Nice. Yeah. A little bit of Oberk polish. I'm gonna, um, Prime a little bit of the pad? Yeah, I'll prime a little bit just because we're only working in a small section. Like I said, I I, I question uh, how important um, priming pads is. Um, it's definitely not a bad thing to do, um, but they are going to get primed eventually anyway. I think even for oh. a new pad too. Yeah. It's it's not a bad idea to do it. No, and especially when we're working in a such a small area where we're actually looking at the befores and after and the results. I think priming the pad is probably the the most important thing so that we're getting the result that we we really want to show. Actually, before we get started, we'll toss it in 15. So do you like doing that? I mean, when you're switching from like a cutting phase to, you know, kind of dialing things back, do you like to go into like a different mode or is that kind of just personal preference? Well, I think it's personal preference. I think for uh, most people in the industry, they're gonna polish with a dual action polisher no matter what. Um, yeah. There's some people that like to polish with a rotary. There's some instances where polishing with a rotary um, can produce better results, but 9.5 or 9.9 .9 times out of 10, um, the average person's gonna grab a dual action polisher because it's just easier. Um, and it's, um, it's just, it's overall easier and it's easier to get the finish that you want. Okay. Okay, so we got it in 15 millimeter.
check it out here. Levi, I know one of your favorite features of this is you've talked about fatigue a lot, and Dave has gone on both 15 and 21, um, but that oh, yeah. machine has been extremely smooth, that whole process. Yeah, that is one of the things that I did notice, my um, the vibration that you normally get in your hands uh, when utilizing the uh, dual action machine uh, was far less using the Udos than I have in other, using other machines. For well, a and I think that I'm working on a car. Yeah, the overall feel of it is a lot different. Um, and, and I think some people will grab it, and it's just such a it's a different feel from the yeah. beginning. Um, but that was one of the things that that was worked on with um, our engineer because he's got um, history and um, balance. Essentially, mm -hmm. is, is his history um, creating medical equipment that, that spins really really fast. Um, so it does have a low low amount of harmonic resonance and a, and a low vibration. But, it, but the overall feel of it is just so much different. Um, yeah. The internal structure of it is, is so much different that it, it definitely... Well, and I, and I will say this. The one thing that, pe in case people are wondering, the Udo's pad line can be used on any DA. It was designed for use for the Udo's machine. Yep. However, putting these pads on your other tools does greatly increase the, uh, the cutability, the polishing ability, the fact that you've got that... Um, rebound basically in the pad where it can contour, it can move very well. Yep. So uh, that's one of the reasons I like it so much is I love the way those pads work. And then, like I said, the the just the balance of this machine works really well. And like I said, I didn't feel the tingly sensations mm -hmm. that I normally feel. Yep. You know. And so that was kind of fun to finish and go, oh, that actually that feels good on my hands. You know. So, I mean, it is a little bit bigger. It's a little heavier. Um, and that's a muscle that you need to strengthen. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're used to a certain type of tool. But if this is, becomes a machine that you're going to ultimately in, use in your shop day in, day out, you build that muscle very quickly to accommodate for that weight, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I started uh, with the, the old school um, we, Milwaukee tool. I mean, oh, was, I remember was, my forearms back then, and, oh, yeah. and it was uh, it was Pretty impressive. Jacked. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, going down to a lighter machine, I was like, well, this is nice, but you know, your muscles atrophy if you're not doing anything. With it them. was a lot different, so. and I, and I think the other um, accessories, especially the pads, kind of play into that performance a little bit too. Um, the shape of the pad is is something that we didn't really talk about. Um, it's kind of like a dual level or a dual taper design, mm -hmm. um, and the idea of it is. You know, obviously the, the tapered um, conical shape is the most desirable or, or really kind of in right now. Um, it does perform really well, so that's one of the main reasons. Yeah. Um, but by doing this um, dual taper, we created the ability to slightly be able to tip the machine or to use it a little bit differently, where most polishers, if you tipped it like that, the, the machine would stall or the pad would stall. Um, but this design allow for a, a slight tipping motion, uh, the ability to uh, manipulate um, tight angles or, or concaves a little bit mm -hmm. um, and still keep rotation on the pad. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we get feedback from from people, whether they're using the Udos machine or other machines, about that they actually just, they love how the pad performs and most of that's related to the shape. Yeah. Um, or I should say that what they're experiencing right, is related exactly. to the shape. Um, that combined with the, the rebound technology is where you know, everybody deals with heat. They, everybody struggles with heat with their pads, um, especially if they're using dual action machines specifically. Um, so everybody that's used these on other machines, I, I get tons of messages and feedback all the time on them. Sweet. Yeah. I dig it. Well, it put out some great results. And uh, Dane, we've got about five minutes left in this session. Are there any more questions over there on your end? Let's see if Dane right. can pop one up. Uh, we did have somebody pointing out here that uh, it is important to note that the Udos is made in the USA. That's true. It is. It is made in the USA. It's manufactured um, in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, in our factory. Oh, that's awesome. And yep. uh, they followed up by also mentioning, do you have a payment plan going in the future to attract even more buyers? <laughs> we don't, but we do have a, a rental program where you can uh, rent the tool and try it. Um, if you decide you want to buy it, you get that that amount taken off of your uh, off of your invoice for purchasing the tool. So it's a, a great way to to try it, see if you like it, and um, 
be some, able to keep that money if you decide to buy it. Get some free pads too. To yeah, you get some. Free oh yeah. Pads too. Mm -hmm. So that's and awesome. uh, we also had this guy writing it to us on uh, another day recently talking about the vibration and sound levels of tools. So he was kind of yeah. interested to know if you guys had had any like official measurements as far as the sound level, say at the Udos. I don't think from like a decibel standpoint, okay. no. Um, I, I don't think we're publishing data of like, it's, you know, how it vibrates compared to other tools, but I'd encourage um, that individual to see if he can get a hands on one um, or yeah, try the rental testing. program. Yeah. 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 I, I think this guy does have a decibel meter. He, he's just kind of one of those who's curious to know that kind of stuff. So I think mm -hmm. he'll probably give it a shot. Yeah, no, I've um, done some with um, just like phone apps and different things. I know, I know there was some initial testing done internally. It's uh, like Andrew said, it's nothing that we've released, but um, but yeah, if you got something that you can base it off of, sure, it, yeah, it's not abnormally loud or anything. It it, it performs within. It within falls the within the range yeah. of what people yeah, are yeah, used to. Much. Yeah. And then we've got Umberto here asking, does it come with some sort of pad prying tool? It does not. All right, um, Umberto. Yep. And then I've got Matthew Gibb, friend of the show. Uh, hey, we Matt. have him writing in and asking, hello, everyone. Do you think the 1,000 RPM on rotary mode, speed one, is a bit high? It's a good speed, but I know Europeans are definitely more used to something like 350 to 900. That's true. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Most of the tools in the U.S. market, they'll go down to 600. Not that there isn't maybe one or two tools that goes lower than that. Um, but if you look at some of the tools on the market, I think it's relative to um, pad size too, right? So there's different mm -hmm. types of body tools, um, different styles of polishers. If you look at, um, let's say a full body tool, like your traditional grinder, um, heavy buffer, something that you might find um, in the traditional Milwaukee, Makita, DeWalt, you know, those, some of those tools will go down to, to 600 RPM, um, but they're also made typically to be using a seven inch backing plate. Right. Um, so you have a, a full body tool that's got a completely different um, makeup in terms of its structure. Um, and it's operating a, a seven inch to eight inch pad it's down to yeah. 600 RPM, something like that. If you look okay. at like a, a Flex P14, you know, that, that tool is gonna drop down to like 900 RPM. So realistically, we're right in the same ballpark of that. Um, because our tool is only comes with a five inch backing plate and currently is not interchangeable, um, we feel like a thousand RPMs is actually kind of a sweet spot. It, it feels really good. It feels slow. You know, it doesn't feel abnormally quick. Um, and for our dual action polisher speed range to work properly with our rotary, um, we didn't want to make their rotary go any slower than that. Okay. No, that's a fair point. That's, yeah. Very then nice I've point. got Chris D. Giovanni asking, would you ever use the S setting with a foam pad or do you strictly use it with sandpaper and Trizac? Mm, so me, me personally, I think um, the way this polisher is set up is it is traditionally used for sanding. Um, we've marked it as for the sanding purpose. Um, it is an eight millimeter, so you, could you use it for polishing? Yes. Um, the way that this polisher is designed is it in eight millimeter option, it's not going to rotate the same way that you'd find in a, in a 15 or 21 or even the 12 millimeter. It's going to limit its rotation. And if you've used pneumatic um, hand sanders, whether in the body shop or anything when you're sanding, um, they don't necessarily operate the same way. If you look at them, they're not apples to apples. A lot of people are sanding with their, with their interface pads and Trizac, and there's orbital movement from the backing plate, but not a lot of circular rotational movement. So um, it's a little bit different of an action. Um, we labeled it S because we're recommending it for sanding specifically, um, but you could use it for polishing. It's just not what we recommend it for. Okay. No, those are all good points. Now, I do have a handhold here more, but at the same time, we're also kind of running low on time. So let me give you these kind of quickly, and we can kind of touch on these before we okay. go. So first up, we've got Frank here. Is there any maintenance on the Udos to keep the adjustability working, and how much does it weigh in pounds, I would assume? Um, there isn't any internal maintenance you have to do with it, um, with that. Okay. And I want to say it's, it's roughly seven pounds. Is that I believe correct? so. 7.1 or 7.2 pounds. Okay. And then we've got Contra here asking, how do we avail ourselves of the rental program? So I think he's looking to maybe uh, yeah. be a part of that. Yeah, yeah go over to um, lcpowertools.com. You can check us out there, and you can sign up for that rental tool program right on the website. Okay, perfect. And 
Oop, got one more here at the top. It's Barry Thiel. Oh, Barry. Get oh, him up Barry, there. What's up, buddy? Does Lake Country plan on making different pads than the current foam ones? Um, uh, say that again for for the Udos machine. Are are we going to be making? It almost seems like he might be asking in general rather than here. I know he probably knows exactly what he's asking, but I don't have a clarification here in the comments, so I couldn't honestly tell you. Yeah, so maybe he's saying, "Is Lake Country going to make other pads for this machine, or maybe are that's planning on making?" bringing this technology over to Lake Country, like... Yeah, I think we're, we're continuing to evolve on um, not only our foam technology, but our, our additional new styles of pads that we're working on. Um, and we've been working on them for a, for a long time. I, I think that you will see um, some new products coming towards the LC Power Tools line, um, but you'll, you'll definitely see new ways that we use um, this chemistry and, and new chemistry to help further development on the Lake Country manufacturing side. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that rounds us out here. Is there anything you guys would like to touch on before we go? Some plugs, give them the website, all that good information? Yeah, I mean, make sure that you check well, us out on all our, our uh, social media platforms, um, LC Power Tools, um, whether that's um, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. Um, we do have our lockable power cord that we're going to be launching alongside the polisher. Um, we just kept looking in shops all the time and noticing that people have a variety of um, extension cords, whether they um, are small or, or large enough for, for their polisher, or what they're doing. Oh yeah. Um, so we just decided to come out with a, a lockable extension cord that is the right gauge and suitable for operating your tool. I don't Perfect. think people really understand that it's not that great to, to operate your tool with a um, with a well, cable that's smaller than yeah. recommended. Well, no, and you see it all the, the time. Amount of power yeah. that we're talking about, you know, like uh, most people with the whole fact of bringing this machine into other markets, you know, you've got to deal with the amount of wattage and current and all the stuff that's in some of these people's shops. And so maybe they've got plenty of electricity, but then they undersize the cord because they go to Home Depot, they pick out the cheapest power cord because they want to be stingy, and that that cord isn't capable to draw the power that a machine is properly supposed to use yeah um and so to bring out your own cord is a is a very smart idea because you compare that with the machine and at least this way the tool it it stops warranty issues um on the motor things of the, that nature you know and it also helps their shops they're not popping breakers yeah i, don't, I mean <laughs> i don't know if everybody's a, a experienced it but um tools can perform a lot differently if if you don't have the proper extension cord right they exactly. lack power too Exactly. All right, Dane. All right. And I have Barry actually clarify here oh, just okay. at the end there. He said Udo specific. Ah, Udo specific. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll have some new stuff. Um, guys, before we move on, the, the next uh, product that we're going to really be showcasing or launching is our new LC Power Tools bag. Um, this is something that I think is just as cool it's as the backing cool. plate. Yeah. Um, it's kind of my favorite thing. I, I believe it's the, the first um, backpack on the market that will actually hold polishers so if we look at the back I'll have Andrew kind of point around to this thing too um, in the back there's slots to hold three different polishers yeah two um, large two, two large, two large and one, one small yeah um, so it's perfect whether you have uh, one full-size Udos and a three inch polisher or if you're using you know multiple tools it can carry everything you need in one bag which I think is really nice um, one of the major concerns was how you're gonna how's that gonna feel on your back when you wear it um, the design the overall design of the the padding and the uh, rigid bottom base yeah. um, really helps how it sits on your back and, it, and it's not uncomfortable. It actually feels really, really good. So um, we're really excited. A lot of the pockets in these things are lined or waterproof um, to prevent anything um, from contaminating your pockets. Um, we've got cell phone pockets. Um, we've got pockets for um, tablets. Um, so if you're a mobile detailer and you bill people out on a tablet, um, we've got space for that. We've got space for your chargers. Um, and then we also have a full fold-out space um, for pockets to fit all of your tools. Yeah. Um, we actually went through multiple cycles of filling these bags and um, determining what we felt like um, any detailer or mobile detailer would want at any given time and making sure there was a spot for this. So while it looks like we just have some you know, pockets in a row, um, we actually took the time to determine the sizing of those pockets and what they typically fit, you know, because nice. a lot of our yeah. items are, are the same type of size. Um, so all of these things are, are kind of thought out. 
Um, in addition to that, we did D rings on the sides um, for um, attaching bags for soiled pads and soiled towels. Mm, so okay. you'll see some more accessories come out um, for the bag to be able to clip onto here and help you organize your tools and organize your towels and organize your pads and um, keep everything moving when you're moving around on the go or mobile detailing. Awesome. Well, there oh, you go. That's great. Cool. Yeah. All right, Dane, we're going to do a quick commercial break, correct? Yes, sir. So let's get to that. tough looking wheel. Finding a light wheel that looks good, it's not always the easiest thing. It can be really stressful. guys for that little break we kind of had to reset move over to the next spot and uh you know need a little bang a little energy to yeah. keep us going for this so uh david and andrew tell us about this is the new pad washer the system 4000 i love, I love it so for those it's a long time coming too yeah, well so long, i've long been time. a pad washing fan for a very long time 
And that's actually how uh, you and I became friends. Yep. I was making phone calls back and forth to each other on parts and accessories and things. So I am super excited uh, to see this new tool and all the benefits of it. Um, I'm a big fan of, oh, my mic's. I'm a big fan of using uh, pad washers when I'm working. We all know because it runs cool, it uh, helps, I feel like it helps kind of clean the pad out a little more so it's not so full of debris. And then I use a lot of closed cell foam pads. Yeah. So I don't, I only use air when I'm using like wool or microfiber to blow them out. But for the rest of my foam is mostly closed cell. Yeah. So uh, to keep them lasting longer, that's one of the reasons. But no, I, think, I think this. they're great. They're great um, for marine detailing too. Not every boat's gel coat, but majority that, of them. That too. It's a, yeah. I mean, that single stage is messy. Yeah, it is. And, you know, so single stage paints. I mean, you still get residue with your traditional clear coats, but mm -hmm. um, single stage paints, you obviously see that. It's a different type of residue. And then same thing with gel coat. Um, with gel coat residue control, or our boats. You know, boats are made with gel coat for the most part. Um, residue control is a big, big deal. Um, so being able to clean your pads on the fly and do it um, in a nice way, like a, with the System 4000, um, is huge. Um, when detailing boats, pads get clogged really quickly. Right. You know, obviously the, the gel coat has oxidation, so you're removing that oxidation. As well as some of that gel coat. Yeah, yeah. So you're removing all that stuff. It's embedded into the pad. Um, and at a certain point, you lose your cutting effectiveness. Um, it doesn't finish the same. So you're really getting you know, no advantage. Um, so pad washers are huge there, too. Um, if you are a pad washer user, you're probably really excited to see this because it is a long time coming. Um, if you're not a pad washer user, um, these updates are, are, are a big deal because yeah. we want you to be a pad washer user. Um, we did some improvements based on all the feedback um, that we've gotten on the pad washer 3000 for the last couple of years. Um, and we kind of rolled them into a, a new updated design. Um, obviously the color is a big one. Yeah. It's a completely different color. Um, most of the parts from the old pad washer to the new pad washer are interchangeable. So everybody that's got one right now and you might want to upgrade or, or update your pad washer, don't worry. Um, almost everything crosses over for you. Um, everything can be adjusted to cross over as well. well. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. So the pad washer is the same design overall, but we did do some changes. Um, we no longer have the filtration system. Um, because we feel like the separated system works much better. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is the, the filters get clogged and it's, a, it's, it's not as, t it's, it's more time consuming than it's worth essentially. Right. So what we've done is we've removed the filtration system. Um, it's pretty much a, a one, one type of a system where the fresh water goes into the bottom of the bucket. You insert your catch basin, you put your pump on top, and essentially what you're doing is you're pumping water from the bottom washing the pad, and then it ends up into your blue catch basin. Um, this is gonna be, this is gonna completely um, contain your contaminated water. Um, it's gonna allow you to, to wash different pads that are using different polishes or, or whatever you need and not worry about contaminating that pad with other abrasive, if that makes right. sense. Right, yeah, no, and that's one of the reasons I use it is because, you know, like I said, like you said, all the dirty abrasive water is here and then all the fresh is down here, and so you're always pulling fresh, but you're always, all that other stuff is getting contaminated, is getting captured. So you don't have that issue of going, oh my gosh, I had a, you know, it only happens if you uh, accidentally pull the wrong bucket and yep. <laughs> drain and, and contaminate your clean supply. So. Yeah, which is a good point. So, and we've done um, two different things to help avoid that. Okay. Um, some people have had issues with our, our previous model where we have a check check valve or a ball bearing that's in here that helps keep the, the pad washer pump primed. So if you're polishing on a car and you go to clean your pad, the water's still there primed, ready to go. You, you hit the pump down and you get water into your pad. Um, because of the new design, um, we've avoided a couple of different issues that we've had where the ball has maybe gone loose and needed to be replaced or replacing parts. So that's a big deal. Um, the second part is exactly what Levi was saying. Um, in the past, we've had a rubber seal Yep. inside the bucket and what that does is it seals the bottom of this pump so that the dirty water that's sitting in this bucket doesn't fall down into the bottom and contaminate your clean water. Um, the issue with the seal was is that it could get misplaced easily. Um, yeah, it was very thin. It's very thin um, and it, it could be replaced regularly or misplaced regularly. So what we did is we came up with a, a little bit more of a permanent solution. Um, I wouldn't say that it'll last forever, 
but it's uh, it's very rare that you're going to have to replace the the grommet that we're using. Well, the and that's a big thing for guys and gals in production shops where maybe you've got employees that are coming in and they they're just trying to to turn and burn, yep. right? They're they're they come in, they change out the pad washer, they're rinsing out, they're trying to go quick to get new water and get it going, and that was my issue. Yeah. I lost a ton of the little grommets. Yeah. Because they they just my guys would go too fast, they wouldn't pay attention, they'd they pull this out, they'd set it on the ground, and the little grommet would be stuck to here, and it would fall off, and then well, roll and down the, the drain. So. The reality is, I'm lazy, so I did the same thing, yeah. and then I just don't use the washer. Yeah. So I'll just I mean, and then I know that sounds horrible, but. The reality is, uh, you know, I'm doing work and, and I just keep using it. Some of my water gets contaminated and, and I'm just too lazy. So this grommet is is a, a great way to fix that. Um, like you can see, it goes onto both sides. So yeah. it seals extremely, extremely well. You you don't get a drop of water that's gonna come through. You'll, your water will never get contaminated. And you don't really have to worry about it going anywhere. So that, yeah. that's gonna be the one of the biggest things. Um, along with that, we pretty much reinforced everything on the pad washer. Um, we realized that you know, when you're washing these pads, it goes through some pretty aggressive movements with your polisher. Right. It gets rattled and, and um, shook around. Um, so just like the way that we restructured the seal, we did that with everything else. So we, so we added um, different support methods in our molding to help yep. keep the structure of everything. And not only on the bottom side of this, but also on the inside of our um, dome as well. Yeah. Um, that was some of the other issues too, where um, there was some some pieces that would break or crack potentially right. because of the vibration and things. And our complete redesign has solved almost all those problems. So um, now you can guarantee that you're not going to have a, a failed product in the middle of a job that you're working right. on. Right. Well, and that's another thing is you always have that new new fella or new employee that, that goes a little too aggressive into oh, yeah. the pad washer. And they've got their machine and they're bang, 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 like trying to get it to, and you're like, whoa, 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 you just, just couple pumps that's all you need to do you don't need to don't need to break the machine and I know I had uh, I had one employee that he was the main reason I had to call you to get new parts because he would really be was just too forceful yeah and that was all it was and so you know to see the upgraded parts the ability to, to make these a little stronger yep. you don't people don't realize the abuse these go through day in day out they're a, a very hardy tool that is like, I've had mine and it's lasted for a long time and it comes with me, but it is, it's nice to see that you guys have built another machine that basically is much stronger. It's gonna last folks a long time and it goes back to that cost per use that I've always talked about. Yeah. You know, people look at this and go, oh, well, I'm, that's kinda, maybe that's a little too pricey for me. Well, you're using this day in, day out, same as the tool. It's gonna help prolong pads. It's gonna help you be more efficient, mm -hmm. which means you're gonna be able to get a car done faster so therefore, you're going to be making more money solely because of this. Yeah, and people love the people love our pad washer so much that, you know, they they call us all the time and they give us feedback to improve our pad washer. Um, like I said, you know, most of these improvements are are based on user feedback. Mm -hmm. They've been they've been based off of you know failed products that we've seen in the past, um, concerns and complaints from our customers that use them, and and those same people that that give us that are still using it because they love it so much. Um, so this is really, you know, our way of finally giving back to them because um, they love they love the tool so much, and we've finally gotten around to taking all that feedback and putting it back into what they love. Yeah. Um, you know, the last the last thing is is really the top. Um, traditionally, in the past, the the pad washer did have a top, a closable top. Um, we've decided to get rid of that. Um, most people aren't using it. Mm -hmm. um, they're just using it open top. So what we did is we redesigned the outer rim to have a little bit more support and structure, um, come out just a tad bit more to help prevent splashing and um, spilling when you're using it. And uh, overall, we're just improving on everything that people loved on it before. And then the last thing is how you hold it. Yeah. Um, not really something that any of us thought about um, besides can you lift it up and does it work? Yeah, and it, and it did. Um, but we got a lot of feedback saying, hey, you know, guys, it's if you don't have any water in this bucket, it's, it's a little difficult to carry. It, it wants to flip or flop. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we did handle extensions. Um, it keeps very the center. Very simple. It's very simple. Um, and not only is it better to carry around when there's no water in it, it's, it's even awesome to carry around when there is water. Overall, it's just a, a really nice tool where the, the pad washer doesn't want to flip or swing. Um, just a, a lot easier to move, maneuver around. It's a lot yeah. more balanced. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Dave. Let's go show people how it works if yeah. they've never used a pad washer. Let's um, do it. Just put it up out here in front. 
we got a couple dirty pads that we were using earlier. And uh, I know some people will have this question too. You know, is it gonna work with a dual action polisher and a rotary or what is it geared for? Yeah, so this is a universal pad washer. It's good for um, dual action and rotary. Um, if you decide to use this for um, specifically rotary, we do sell a, a little bit different style of a pad washer that is really more made for the, the seven, eight, nine inch type pads that you'll find for rotary polishing. Um, but this is our standard polisher. Um, most people are using it with a DA, but it, it is safe for both a DA and a rotary. Um, the way this pad washer works is we're gonna pull out all of our buckets. Um, we've got some, some water with our, what we got, Snappy Clean or O&R or something in there? I don't know, he uh, filled it some, up. Some O&R in there. Okay, <laughs> so we, got, we have our water and our pad cleaning solution, whatever you choose to use. Um, we've got that into the bottom of the bucket. It looks a little white, but it's clean. Um, we'll press in our catch basin to make sure it's nice and tight. Now we're gonna insert the pickup tube down through the grommet, and we gotta make sure that we don't, we align it straight so we don't push the grommet out or you right. know, have any issues. There we go. And then what we'll do is we'll press the plate to prime the pump. Okay, so we got water, everything's primed and ready to go, and now you're ready to clean your pads. Um, one of the things I, I need to stress as much as I can is that um, even though we've made a lot of upgrades, realistically a lot of the, the failures and the damaged parts that we see are because people are using their polisher at like speed five or six when right. they're cleaning their pads. Right. Um, you really need to drop it down. It's going to be much easier to use. Um, you're not going to you're not you're going to have so many so many less problems. You're not going to have water splashed all over the place. Um, you're not going to damage the center of the wash plate. You're not going to damage your pad. Um, endless things. So just make sure you turn your polisher down. Um, what I like to do is prime the pad, just get a little water in there first. It's not necessary. Um, and I'll turn it down obviously. So then I'll turn it up a little bit towards the end so I can dry it, and then it removes all the debris from the pad. Wow. Um, if you have a little bit more water in it and not on a slick floor, it tends to, to stay. Well, and one of the things that I did in my shop was I actually put uh, the uh, bucket kind of dollies. I'd do the bucket dollies on there, and then I would add a five-gallon bucket, fill it with water, put a lid on it, and then I would set one of these on top of that. Yep. So then I made the height of that pad washer about to here so that when we were working, we just, you go right here and you're limiting the amount of movement and bending down That's and hurting your back. Um, it was a very simple, easy fix. And for one of our bays, one of my guys just liked having a stationary spot where he could just work at. And so that was one of his things was he just had to, he, he needed that step away tried to get him wheels, but he needed, but well, same thing. We just set up a five gallon bucket, filled it with water, put a lid on it, and then set the pad washer on it. And that was just his pad cleaning area, as he yeah. called it. Yeah, no, I mean, they're great if you want to just use a, a traditional, you know, bucket dolly that people use for car washing too, to yep. maneuver around the shop. Um, that adds a little bit of extra weight onto the bottom of it too, so it, it kind of just holds it down. Um, or you have one of those carts that's got the hole, just like you were saying, you can yep. just pop it up yeah, in the hole and on. have it right next to you and um, go about your way. But you know, the, the nice thing about these things is you can utilize them in different ways. So right. um, sometimes I'll, I'll utilize them with, um, you know, like a product like O&R or something, mm -hmm. um, and I'll use it during my process um, because the O&R doesn't kind of contaminate my pad and right. cause issues. So if I'm doing a boat, I'll, I'll clean my pad throughout that process. And, you know, other times I, I'm cleaning pads at the end of the day. So I'll, I'll toss my pads in a bucket of water or I'll leave them to till I'm done. And then I'll go through and I'll clean them with um, maybe a snappy clean or, or something right. more aggressive um, to clean them up after I'm, I'm done for the day. Yeah, and like me and my guys would put a diluted APC, hang it on the, off one of these, off of this, the handle. Yep. And then it would sit there. And so if they're, they were working on something really heavy, they could give the, give the pad, you know, while it was on the tool, a couple sprays, set it back on the hanger and then kind of help 
kind of clean that pad out a little more, especially when we're working on single stage or oh, totally. like you said, gel coats where those pads just get filled. filled no, I, I think stuff. that's a brilliant idea too. I, I think um, having a, a, a pre-cleaner or a pre-treater, just like you would clean an interior of a car, something yep. like that, you're utilizing it the same way. And we do have people that put heavy APCs or even degreasers in there. Um, it works. We don't have any issues, but I will say that it's not typically what I would recommend. I, yeah. I, I'm not gonna recommend um, putting a high pH solution into your pad washer bucket um, that could potentially cause issues long-term. Um, so I think um, having more a, a more pH balanced solution um, yeah. and having the ability to pre-treat is a much better approach to do Well, that. and that's one of those things that like, you know, a lot of people will, you know, not realize, again, the usefulness of a tool until they actually have it with them yep. and you know there are a ton of people who oh i don't i don't need a pad washer then you give them a pad washer or they go use one on a job site with somebody maybe they're helping another detailer and they're like oh my gosh i don't know how i lived without it yep you know and it's one of those things that i truthfully tell people if if uh if a detailer's just starting out and they're talking about what they want the pad washer nine times out of ten saves them time saves them money especially if they're hand cleaning their pads. Yeah. You know, we've got a lot of mobile guys that don't have an air compressor. They don't run with an air compressor. And then they take all their pads home and they sit there and wash them themselves at night. Yep. You think about if you've got, you know, say this stack of pads at the end of the day, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of time to let them sit, soak, yeah. hand scrub, clean. It's a lot of damage on your fingers. It's a lot of damage on your joints, you know, and having this is, I mean, it pays for itself no, in, I, I in two agree. days, really, Yep. you know, if not the first car. No, so. I, I mean, I, I like to compare it to like a detailer's helper. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's one of those tools where you see a, a big break. There's either you're a detailer's helper belt user or you're right. not, you know. Um, but I think it, it's the same type of thing. It's one of those things where you don't really understand the value or, or the importance until you actually have it and you use it. Yeah. Um, you just, if you're not a user, you just don't understand it and you don't get it until you've actually experienced it. You're like, man, I can't believe I, I could have been using this so much earlier and, right. and save yep. time. So I think that's Sweet. where the pad washer falls. I dig so, it. And I like all those upgrades. Wool too, then? Yeah, it works Ooh, with micro wool, okay. works with microfiber, um, pretty much anything. Yeah. And I, that's, that's honestly one of my favorite ways. So I do use air to clean my uh, wool when I'm working. Yep. But when I'm done, or let's say I grab a new wool off the shelf or a used one mm -hmm. that I used previously, the first things I do is, is always wash them. Yep. Is, is clean them with a little APC diluted and then washing my, my washer with, my, my uh, pad washer with O and R. Yep. You know, so. Absolutely. Makes it great. And I like doing that too. And like when, it's, when I'm finally done with that, I'll actually switch it over to the rotary setting to just yep. clean it all out. Yeah, blow them get, out. And get it really, really dry. Yeah, yeah ultimately, um, especially drying it. helps drying it a lot on rotary function. It dries quicker. The towels or the pads dry quicker when you, when you spin it that way. Well, that's, the, that's the benefit of using Udos. Exactly. <laughs> you got it right there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, let's ask Dane and see if we have any questions kind of regarding uh, this product. It's coming out um, next year. Um, like maybe mid January. It's mid January. Yep, yeah, the mid -January, launch will be mid January. Launching. So, uh, okay. I'm sure there's some questions regarding that. Yeah. Dang, so there were we got? a few that came up here. I think most people were just curious watching a pad washer because I think, I I think it. I think the pad washer can be kind of an unfamiliar concept for some people. So seeing one, it may be the first time they've Fair. actually seen one. So uh, yeah, if you guys can hear me now, just I got double you checking. Now. Okay, yep. great. Got you now. I, can hear you I was now. just saying how the pad washer is kind of a, an unfamiliar concept for some people. They may not even be aware that such things exist. So it's nice to have it out there so people can see what it looks like, how it acts. But, uh, yeah, we had some people making some comments saying it was nice that there was uh, a way to prevent cross-contamination with this. And then there was – ah, here we go. We got Chris again. I'm going to put Chris D. Giovanni here. Should I be doing this only when finished with polishing pads? So I think he's thinking you can't use it midway. Should you wait until you're totally done before you wash your pads? No, um, you can use it either way. Um, just kind of like how we were talking about a little bit ago, you can utilize it um, with either just water um, with O&R or a, a very mild snappy clean um, dilution for in, like in use. So like if you're cleaning pads on the fly during your polishing process, um, if you're using it 
at the end to clean pads, um, then you could use something maybe like a full strength snappy clean or uh, another pad specific cleaner that might be a little bit more aggressive. Um, so you can really adjust how you use it, um, whether you're using it while you're polishing the car or whether you're using it at the end and cleaning all your pads. Um, most people that I find are probably operating it kind of like Levi where they're using it during their process. Yeah. Helps cool the pad, helps keep the yeah. pad clean. Um, so you can definitely use it while you're polishing the car. Um, but obviously everybody uses them at the end of the job too. Yeah, no, and, and we do here. We use them a lot during the job. Um, then I've got here a couple more. I've got Chris Johnson asking, is there a kit being offered to upgrade from a 3000 to a 4000? So he's wondering maybe if they're interchangeable parts, he could just swap it around, or is it a full meal deal? It's just straight to the new 4000. Um, no, I mean, there, there are upgraded pieces. We've talked about it internally about making a little kit. Um, there's, there's not necessarily you know, a kit that you need per se. Um, typically, I would say upgrading as it changes. You know, the biggest thing is, is as you change into our new updated parts, the colors are a little bit different. Um, so I think that's probably where the kit might come in handy is if you could buy all the parts and kind of convert it and make it look like the new kit. So um, that's a great question. Um, we did discuss it briefly, but we didn't have any initial plan to launch the upgraded kit. Um, but I have a feeling that's gonna be a question that gets repeated quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so I, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you'll have uh, have that if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. I, I was also going to point out between uh, questions here that your shoes, that bang can, and the pad washer all have a similar color scheme going on. I, I just my, thought that my, was my, kind my, of my, funny that it he jumped said out. Your, he said uh, <laughs> Andrew's bang no, the, can and your yeah. shoes have a similar color scheme to the uh, pad washer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was picking up when you were crouched <laughs> next to it. It was like they were all right there. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so let's see here. What else we got going on? Oh, Gumi made sure I knew how to pronounce his name, so where's that? I took care of that. <laughs> uh, and then let's see. So, yeah, no, it was more or less like that. I think we definitely have some comments about pads here. I'll pull up Detail Dude who said, I love those SDO pads. I've been using them forever. I wanted to upgrade to HDO, but the SDO just don't want to give up. Um, yeah, those SDOs are hardy pads, that's for sure. Um, so are the HDOs, for that matter. Yeah, I think, I think with anything when it comes to if you like that specific pad, right? Um, I mean, the SDO and the HDO, they have the same front face here, and so it's the same exact foam that you're using. Um, the really biggest difference is kind of the dual face uh, or the dual foam interface here. So. We really created, I mean, Dave was uh, part of this whole, whole ordeal of creating the, the dual foam, and this was really more focused on uh, the 15s and the 21s and even getting into force rotation where there's so much heat that's created in between the backing plate and the foams here. And the biggest difference really between the SDO and the HDO is that in, right here, you're kind of letting that pad cool down a little bit in between the processes if you're polishing or cutting and in the SDO version it really depends on which tool you're using um, that some of that heat may dissipate a little bit more from the backing plate into the pad and so if you want to make that that leap and you're using you know a long throw uh, polisher um, these pads will probably give you a little bit better user experience um, but the same the same it's you're really using the same foams and so if you're happy with the SDO, you know, stay with it. It's it's a great product line that we have. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, no complaints. They, the HDO is always going to offer that that premium value because of that dual layer design. And you know, we've done. I'm sure you guys probably have a couple of videos that we've done on the the advantages. But you know, the the dual layer design is is kind of a a multiple advantage type of thing. For one, you have your your moisture barrier. Um, so between the layers, your polish can't soak up into the upper layer. Um, that's going to that's going to help with a number of different issues. It's going to help with the longevity of the pad, how the uh, heat gets transferred throughout the pad, and how that liquid or vapor gets, um, and when I say vapor, I guess steam, gets transferred throughout the pad as well. So um, when we're looking at these pads, not only is that blocking the, the liquid going up and down. There, I got it. 
You can keep going. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, not only does it does it block the the liquid from going in between the layers, but it it limits the amount that the pad moves um, horizontally or laterally. Um, and what that does is it limits the amount of friction or heat that's created inside of the pad. Um, molecular friction is when um, when the material um, flexes and moves inter internally, it, it makes heat. Um, and by minimizing the thickness of foam, we minimize the um, flexibility of that and we reduce the heat. Um, in addition to that, um, because of the tapered design and this dual layer, you get a more even distribution of down pressure. So there's really multiple things that go into building the HDO pad into what, it, what its purpose and what its value is. But you know, all of that, um, all that performance and value is really coming off um, with the intention to be used on long throw polishers. And when these HDO pads came out, um, we found people using them on all types of polishers. So not only did we feel like we wanted to make a more entry level um, pad that was more suitable for um, some of those other tools that don't get that added value from this pad, um, it's also a way for us to continue to sell these foams that we've developed that everybody loves. Right. Um, so it's just a different variation. Um, it's a more um, reduced consumer, more, a more consumer price point for high volume shops, um, you know, business where that the premium pad just doesn't, doesn't make sense for what they're doing. Yeah, sure. Good and point. you know what, I've actually, I have like a little debate going on in the comments where the guys are kind of talking about say like where they see the point of a pad washer whereas others are just like just buy more pads it's kind of a back and forth thing because some of these guys are mobile detailers yeah. so there's like a little bit of a balance between the two where they're like mm, i'll just use more pads on a job but maybe for some people they'd rather wash i mean where where do you see the cost benefit analysis going in that so situation it, so what are you saying is a debate between the uh, detailers online on buying more pads and then just going home and cleaning them or actually buying a pad washer for the job site and the benefits between the two. Obviously, uh, you're supposed to buy everything. All the Lake Country things. <laughs> buy it all. I mean, that, that's how, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Like, yes, Andrew would love it if you bought uh, 50 pads for yeah. every job. Well, yeah, the, the easy answer is yes. Right? Yes. He, he won't be mad it. about yeah. it. I mean, <laughs> if you want to buy a pad washer, yes, again, even better. If you're using these pads and the pad washer, everything's good. So, yeah, it, it really is personal preference at that point. It's the detailer's preference, and it's really like yeah. that style. It is. Know? Yeah. I mean, and not to make it more confusing than what it needs to be, is, is just the you know, there's a place for everything. So if I'm going to work on a, um, like, like Jeff's car here, if I'm going to work on that, it's open. I might question whether I want to be washing my pads up around that area because I don't want to spray stuff inside the car in case the pad's a little damp, things like that. Where if I'm working on, you know, a larger truck or something, I'm not really, really worried about it. So even if, if, enough, even if I love using a pad washer, there might be certain instances where I say, eh, I don't, I don't really want to use it for this. I'll use more pads. So right. I think it, there's, there's a lot of variables that go into making that decision um, it, where you could actually side either way. Yeah, so and I the, think... Hopefully the debate continues. <laughs> his, his main... Uh, this was detailed dude here. He was making sure I pointed out that he's specifically mobile. So that okay. was his motivation was more things to put in the car was kind of right. his logic. He goes, pads will take up less space than a washer, so I go that route. But for a guy in a shop, I mean, the washer makes perfect sense, but... I'm sure somebody could easily fit a bucket in a van or something. Yeah, it just I depends mean, on what vehicle you're using. I mean, if you're driving around in a, a small hatchback or something with a low trunk or something, okay, fine, I get it. But a van or something. Hey, that it, bucket has a nice <laughs> spot right on the front seat, Dane, of that Jaguar of yours. Oh, that's you right. Know? I mean, all it's else nice fails. Spot. It's a passenger put now. A, put a well, seatbelt on it, and it is safe. I think Precious cargo. Just, do like a Pimp My Rides Ray Company edition uh, and we could yeah, dude, put do it, it in the trunk where the spare tire would be. <laughs> yeah. And you could wash pads in the back of your trunk. Yeah. Ooh. Get a piece of plywood, pull out that spare tire. You know, who needs those nowadays, right? Yeah. You don't Build need it right in. Build it perfect. right in. Yeah, well, perfect. Right a spare in tire when you can wash pads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like one of those swing out on the back of an old Bronco. You got the, yeah, yeah. Hey, just right out go. like that, but it's pad washer. Well, you just gave me a, a better idea. We'll put a trailer <laughs> hitch on it. We'll do a swing out seat. So now you can sit and clean it in your trunk of your Jaguar. 
perfect. I mean, I've seen in the perfect. new Broncos they do something like that on the inside of the back door. It's like a little flip down portion. It yeah. overlanding's all the rage. Just swap it for like a mobile detail. Yeah, kit. get those little <laughs> tables and they, you know you mount them on there. Look, awesome. at yeah. Look at us creating and designing innovation. All kinds of Who says you don't innovate? It's Come all on. Live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So uh, yeah, what are some other common things you find people ask about pads? Because you guys are the experts, arguably, for anything when it comes to foam pads, any kind of pads, just any kind of pad technology. What's some stuff that you see happening in the Told industry hot where things talk. are going? This is the time to do the hot pad talk. Yeah. Well, I think there's a number of different ways that you could look at how the industry is going. I think um, it all depends on how you, how you use product. Um, the CCS has always been a staple product of ours. It's our clap cell structure. Um, and this essentially is what Lake Country came to be a competitive product to a traditional waffle pad. Um, the advantage of it, of a waffle pad is that it breaks surface friction, mainly. Um, and what that does is it makes the polisher run smoother, run cooler, and um, you know, just create an overall better user experience because you're not gonna mm -hmm. you know, get that uh, chop, chatter, or skipping of the polisher as it warms up or um, gets clogged. Um, so the, the CCS dimples act very similar to a waffle in that, that matter, except the, the actual pockets are collapsed cell structures of the foam so that the polish can't actually absorb into the foam, um, keeps it at the surface, gives you a longer working time, uh, more effective, overall just a really, really nice design feature. Um, these products are still some of our number one products sold. Even though rotary polishing isn't the most common, um, these pads have just been such a staple and the performance has been proven for so long that, um, that, they, that they still are, are one of our flagship products. Yeah. Um, so we do make these in um, versions for dual action polishers. Um, we make them in versions for rotary, called our precision rotary line. Um, but they are, they are hands down uh, one of our most popular pads and they are part of our LC originals. So these are some of our flagship products that have been around for a long time. Um, our wool pad products is something that we're um, becoming really, really well known for. Um, we've always been really well known for our purple foam wool. I think a lot of people know that. Um, but as we continue to develop um, different types of uh, knitted, woven, and uh, micro wools, um, people are starting to see how our product line is expanding and how we're innovating. Um, so when you look at some of the different products that we have, you'd say, well, why, why would I use one over the other? Um, each one of them has its peak performance, but a lot of the times it's a personal preference too. So um, just because I would typically suggest a pad to be used one way, right. doesn't mean that Levi uses it that way. It doesn't mean that he likes to use it that way. And he might actually like to use something else that I wouldn't suggest. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's a lot to that. When we look at our, our purple foamed wool, um, this was actually one of the first bridges into, let's say, microfiber, mm -hmm. you know, before microfiber was a thing. Um, this is a, a lamb's wool pad, so there's 100% lamb's wool in this, but it's blended with a, with a polyester type product, so it's very similar to a wool microfiber blend. Um, this specific product works best on a rotary or a forced rotation tool, in my opinion. Um, they do work well on um, dual action polishers, but we have other products that are specific for that that I think perform a little bit better. So. When we're looking at purple foamed wool, I really love these for rotary. I really love them for forced rotation, and they can be used on dual action polishers. Yeah. Um, the product that I would typically recommend for dual action polishers when we get into the wool arena is our, our low lint wool. Um, this pile height is a little bit shorter, so where you'd see our, our purple wool is roughly three quarters of an inch to an inch tall, um, this wool is only about a half of an inch, and I think, um, the height of the wool helps the performance when dealing with a dual action polisher. We try to talk about it like um, if you were to dangle spaghetti, um, if I have you know, one that's a half inch and one that's one inch, this half inch one is gonna be a lot more effective because it's not gonna just flop around with, right. the, with the rotation or the orbit of the polisher. Um, so the half inch pile is a little bit more of a, a neutral pile height that works great for all types of machines. So if you are using a um, a rotary tool or a Udo's tool or a DA tool, um, this pad can work for all of them and it works very well. Um, we chose to do a, a foam interface on the back of this pad 
um, for overall user experience. Um, but it is, a, it is a pretty premium type of pad. So we, we do offer these two different ways. We offer them in the EC version, mm -hmm. um, which is our extra cut because it doesn't have the interface and it's a little bit more rigid. Um, but this is the, the typical pad that I would suggest for, um, for cutting on a DA if you were to use wool over, let's say, a purple, something like that. Um, so those are going to be like kind of your main things. Obviously, we already touched on um, the HDL pads, which is designed and, and geared towards long orbit or long throw polishers. Um, but just like we talked about the SDL pads, we saw so many people using these products. Um, the price of the HDO pad is premium because of the way that it's made. Um, and being that half of the users that weren't buying it for that purpose, right. um, we just decided to, de to develop the SDO pad to better suit those types of uses. So um, HDO pads work actually fantastic on dual action. They work great on forced rotation. They work great on rotary. Um, but typically, we recommend these for your long orbit or long stroke polishers. If you like these pads and you use the forced rotation, we would recommend the SDO. Um, mm -hmm. We think it's more um, cost effective for you, especially if you're a high volume shop, and you get all the things that you want out of the pad without um, the extra cost for a pad that's really designed for something else. Right, yeah. That's true. Dave, and there's a couple of like, I know I get this question a lot, but you see, it, like this is a pad we were talking about earlier, and this is probably an inch and a quarter, and some of these other pads are a little bit thinner profile. What, what's the reasoning behind that? And is a thicker pad better for me, or should I use a thinner pad, or what, why is there a big difference between kind of the thicknesses of pads? Well, you're seeing the thickness of pads kind of stabilize a little bit. We used to see a lot more um, difference between thickness. Um, typically, you'll find um, in DA pads, you're gonna find something like three quarters of an inch to an inch thick. Uh, that's going to kind of be the go-to. Uh, if you look at our HDO pads, these are um, one inch thick. Yeah. Um, if you look at our Udo's pads, these are one inch thick. Um, if you look at our basic DA CCS pads or our SDO pads, they're seven eighths of an inch thick. Um, so if you find most of our pads are, are roughly seven eighths to, um, to one inch for most dual action pads, we do make some pads that go up into an inch and a half. Um, we do make some, some rotary pads that go even thicker than that. But most of the products that you see on the market um, even if they get a little bit thicker, they're going to be roughly an inch and a quarter. And, and where you find those thick pads is in our force line. Okay. Um, the force line is, is designed specifically for gear-driven or forced rotation machines. And, and mainly that's because, you know, on a, on a gear-driven or forced rotation machine, you can really put in extra weight or extra right. pressure into it. That's, that's one of the advantages. There no yeah, there's no stall. So one of the advantages is you can adjust your down pressure to you know, manipulate your performance. And in order to increase your down pressure, you have to have some meat, you know, you gotta have some meat and potatoes on yeah, there. Right. So, um, so sometimes an inch and a quarter pad works a little bit, works a little bit better. Um, at the end of the day, um, it does come down to a personal preference. We design the pads and the systems for how we think they perform the best. Some people just like something else. Yeah. Um, so just like we said with the SDO, even though our, our, our forced rotation pad line is inch and a quarter, we have so many people that love the SDO line which is seven eighths of an inch. Yeah. Well, and like we said, it, it's that personal preference. It's what works for you. Yeah. You know, like I said, like I've been using the Udo's pads almost exclusively at home when I'm working on cars. And that's the crazy thing is that I, I always used at, the HDOs were my main go-to and the lambs, the, the lambs wool and uh, one, the low lint wool. And that was one of the funny things is when I first got that batch of Udo's pads, I was like, Man, I really like these things, and so instantly now it's just primarily Udos, and then, like I said, the Rupes Blue Wool is still one of my favorites. But this takes press; these take precedence in my shop. This is what I reach for um, because I've always, and that's what I've loved about Lake Country is the idea of this pad is designed for this tool movement yep. to give you the best cut, best finish, best pot, whatever you need it for. It's designed there. And there's all these different options. That's yeah. one of the things that I love, you know, is that there's an uh, available market for whatever type of tool you have to really, whether you're just starting out, you know, and you picked up like, let's say a Porter Cable 7424, you can grab these CCS pads and get a crazy good oh, finish yeah. with it. Phenomenal. You know? Especially pair it with a little bit of microfiber if you need something super heavy cut. Yep. And you got everything you need. And, and honestly, the, the Udo pads are, um, 
creating some technical difficulties in my process currently because you know you guys have seen in the past if, if you've seen some other videos that we've done or, yep. or videos that I've done um, you know not only did I design the HDO pads but I, I genuinely use them I, yeah. I, I do really love them They're kind um, of your baby they are kind of my baby and I mean that's <laughs> um, that's one of the reasons why I talk about them the way that I do because I but I do actually use them and I, I do really like them um, but with the new Udo pads it's it's really difficult I mean I love the khaki pad um, I think it performs really really well it's um, you know these pads are so close but you know the khaki almost falls in between these two yeah um, so it's it's just one of those things where I'm actually really loving the Udo pads myself I'm having a hard time of how I fit that into where I was before traditionally I've always been HDO with a microfiber cut and a low lint wool pad and I can do it all and that's my yeah. that's my deal um, now it's I'm your jam yeah now it's my that's my jam now I'm reevaluating and trying to figure out um, where it has a place well, and that's that's one of the things that I love about it. like I said each you know we get so many calls so many questions so many customer service requests because people go how do I pick the right pad mm -hmm. you know and we've done our best to explain like if you're using this type of tool here's the pads for you if you're using this type of tool here's the pads for you if you're using this type of tool these here's are the pads, pads. Yep. and that has given customers a very clear point to to really hone in you know it's not just a universal choice, even though a universal kind of does help sometimes for folks to where they go, oh, okay, I got it. I know. This is, this is you may have gone from a universal system. Now you want to focus that a little bit better. Maybe you want to try and hone your paint correction skills. This is why these work. And this speaking of questions, I have a few here for you guys, oh, if lovely. you don't mind. There's a nice little row of them here I can touch on. Um, <laughs> Some interesting ones. So let's see here. We've got uh, okay. a debate about vans in Europe going on because of the whole space efficiency thing we talked about with buckets. <laughs> so that started its own thing. But okay. uh, in addition, we have Kirby Thompson here asking, will this pad washer be shown at Mobile Tech in February? So he wants Absolutely. to know if you could see it yep. as an example mm -hmm. there. Yep. It will be and there. then we've got James Wells with a ergonomics question. Do you all plan on making a bucket taller? I'm six foot four. <laughs> well, a six foot bucket would be pretty tall, so I don't know, yeah. or, or even a five foot bucket. But um, no, I don't think so. I, I think there there are carts on the market that might be um, suitable mm -hmm. for you. Um, sure. Buckets yeah. are so hard to ship um, to begin with. Um, anybody that's bought in buckets, whether it's just a regular bucket or, or something sized like a bucket, um, they're not the easiest items to ship. So um, right. I don't think we'll probably be expanding on the height too much. I think that. a dolly would also help. Yeah, well, a dolly, dolly, and like I said, where you get a five-gallon bucket with a lid, fill that with water, and then you just raise that yeah, up. It makes it, that. it makes that's it a, that's a much tip. easier. That is a pro Much tip. easier. That's a pro tip. Then pro I've tip, got Broham73 here. Nice bro, bro. bro. You know, right there in the translation. Does Lake Country have a pad specific for one-step polishing? So he wants to know if there's like a magic pad that works for one-step polishing. Honestly, for me, it's always been the orange foam has always been my go-to for a one-step. Yes. And the orange HDO in that, everybody knows my 20-minute one-step. Yep. Orange HDO is what I use with my 15. So, yeah, so we do actually. We have, we have an actual one-step pad. That, that, that'll be the first one that I suggest. <laughs> and then we have pads that, <laughs> that are widely used for one-step polishing. So, sure, um, yeah. We, we did create a microfiber one-step pad that we launched a couple years ago. Um, this pad is is really unique and cool. It it cuts pretty decently. Um, it falls underneath what you typically find in a in a cutting pad. It's going to be more like what you find in most microfiber polishing pads. Um, but we increased the density of it a little bit and uh, made it where it finishes out really nice. So this pad is okay. is actually our um, our OSP or our one step microfiber pad. Official one. Yeah. One step. Oh, pad. well, um, so see, exactly there it is, right in the name. For. <laughs> um, but then going back into what Levi said, um, I would say. We have two foams or two things that I that I constantly come back to where we have people talking about that they use for one step and it's it's orange and blue. Yeah. Um, blue is going to be a little bit harder, so I would say one step pad for any of your lighter colored vehicles, any of your vehicles that have harder paint, you know, anything that's not really really dark. Yeah. I mean, you're like going to get a good silver, finish. gold. Yeah. Some of the lighter colors. Um, on some of the darker colors, you might get some micro mar in your haze, but really that's all going to depend on the polish or the liquid that you're using with the pad. Sure. Um, so the combination is obviously the, the important part. Um, but going to what Levi said, I would say 
If you were to ask me what is Lake Country's most versatile foam pad, I would tell you that it's our orange pad. Yeah. Um, I think our orange pad finishes out uh, nine out of ten cars that come out of my shop. Most of the time, yeah. That's, it's reliable. Feel, it's versatile. I, it's yeah. so, versatile. Yeah, and that's one of the things is like, you know, in your terms of color, that's going to be always your most aggressive color, and then black's going to be your most fine. And 90% of the time, I don't even need to jump between these two. I can get, I can finish, I can cut and finish just about everything yep. that I need to from, you know, a one step or a two, light two step process. I'm identical with you. I, this is my go-to, my versatile pad. I will tell you that on the, on that equal standpoint, you have people that will tell you this is it. Yeah. Um, so and I can, I totally get that on a lighter I, color. I get it too. And actually I, I love this pad, but for me, the orange pad is, is um is my go-to it might be climate mm -hmm. you know it might be the products that we use mm -hmm. um so there's other variables that go into it our climate is very similar here than it yeah. is in wisconsin so that could be it but but it, i would say our orange is the most versatile pad it, it's the sure. pad that finishes on almost everything but really can be adjusted and actually works really good as a as a lighter medium cutting pad too if you wanted to use it with a compound yeah. And hands down, the most versatile pad in our arsenal. Now, I've got a question, just because I'm sure somebody out there wondered, when it came to the OSP, the one-step pad, is that a DA-specific, or is it able to be used in multiple tools? No, that's DA-specific. Um, okay. I, I think we find microfiber being used all over the place, depending on the areas of the world. But yeah. for the most part, what we find here in the U.S. and for most of the trend is microfiber pads are traditionally used on the dual-action policy. Yeah, sure. And I've got a note here from Dan simply wanting to say, I've used the purple foamed wool on a porter cable and it saved the job. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. And then oh, back again with the one step polishing. We answered that. And oh, propelling imagery hmm, seems familiar. Asking if we'll be carrying these products. Well, we certainly carry a wide array of Lake we Country carry pads. A very Definitely wide array do. Of Lake Country pads. Um, the ones we don't actually carry that we probably should are obviously the Udos pads and that one step pad is uh, right. probably going to be added to our list of products to be available here at the Rag Company. Yep. And I've got a couple more here. One's a note from Gumi here. Wanted to say the black microfiber pad does not get the credit that it deserves. Amazing pad. You know, <laughs> you are 100% right. And I would say uh, most people finish with foam. Uh, foam is something that just people traditionally finish with the black microfiber that we have is is a true finishing pad it's not a polishing pad it is not very aggressive um, but it does finish phenomenally well um, people do like it but because it's you know microfiber is just traditionally known for the cutting mm -hmm. or, or, or how yeah, effective i was and gonna it, say you know the amount of cut you get with a with a a good finish in a short period of time so that's where everybody really looks at the microfiber and i think our, uh, that person is 100% right. The black microfiber is the one that doesn't get credit. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things that I, I would say, there's, there's two secret nuggets, I would say. The, the black microfiber is great for metal polishing, especially soft metals. So Ooh, your aluminum, okay. your brass, um, yeah. anybody that's doing um, bright work, concours work, stuff like that, you'd be really, really, really surprised. Um, I did significant amount of testing with um, you know, soft brass and aluminums and hands down that pad is is the best you're going to get um, out of anything that Lake Country offers. Um, so I think I think that's probably the bi the biggest thing there. Okay. There and uh, I, I then wanna, I've also I got reiterate too, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. <laughs> These yeah. guys have been talking about their favorite pads. Well, my favorite pads are actually the microfiber and I am a <laughs> huge fan of just two-stepping it with a cutting pad and a finishing pad. So for whatever it's worth for the audience back at home, <laughs> I, I love the foams, uh, but I can finish everything out probably 90% of the time with both these, uh, the, the cutting and the finishing pads. So I wanted, I wanted to let everybody know that. Thank you. It is, yeah. my, yes. it is my favorite, um, even though they have their favorites because everybody has their little favorite and, and what they can do well, with the pads. It goes back to that personal preference. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. Well, yeah. It, well, it really does. There's no wrong answer. People yeah. wonder how you end up with a lineup that has like 500 different products in well, it. Yeah. It's because there's so many different preferences to go to. Well, and it's the same yeah. thing with us and towels, right? Yeah, we that's what six, I was getting seven at. different type of window <laughs> towels. Yeah. They're all great, but right. it goes back to what do you like the best and what yeah. works for you. And at the end of the day, having those options available 
allow you to really hone in on what you want to do as a detailer. So, yes, yeah, and I it. actually have one last question okay. here. This no, is a good it. one, kind of a way to kind of send us off with this one where he wanted some details. I'll throw this up here. Scott Mattern asking, can they talk about differences between open and closed cell foams? Also, I'm interested in hearing about using LC pads in place of proprietary pads, which manufacturers match with their polishes. Okay. Um, I don't know if I understand the second part of the question, but we'll start sure. at the first and we can kind of jump back. Um, actually, can you, can you say it one more time? Yeah, Sorry, yeah, no problem. It. So I'll, I'll paraphrase. Basically, okay. he wants to know the differences between open and closed cell foams. Okay. So you got that. And then the yep. second part was he must be buying his uh, polishes where they come with like a pad that they recommend. And he wants to know where he should sub in like a Lake Country pad. Got you. Um, so you can always reach out to us on our website and we can help you line up a pad that works for you. I think that's probably the, um, the easiest way to answer that question where there's always somebody available to, to answer your questions on that end. Um, closed cell versus open cell. I would say open cell is, is a little bit more popular and available these days. We do make some closed cell foams. Um, open cell foams have always traditionally been a little bit stronger and dissipate heat better. Um, and as dual action polishers have become more and more popular, um, they're obviously more popular for that same reason. Um, closed cell pads are really, really nice and they do work a little bit differently. Um, I think you're going to start seeing more closed cell technology maybe in, in the future as um, chemistry allows for more durable, more durable foams. Mm -hmm. So um, typically the, a closed cell foam doesn't have the same um, tear resistance and durability as that open cell does. And, and with these new chemistries that are being developed, you're gonna, I think you're going to see some new products that come out that, that do have those traditional um, advantages of closed cell foam but give you the same type of characteristics that we all love from an open cell phone. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that brings us right to the end of the hour here. So thank you so much for the great presentation. I think, I hope, people learned something along the way. And uh, are there any final notes from you guys? Once again, uh, plug where people can find more information if they're looking for it. Give us the details. Yeah, so... Websites are first, uh, Lake Country MFG, as in manufacturing.com, and lcpowertools.com. Um, for Facebook and Instagram, you can find us, Lake Country Manufacturing. You gotta spell out manufacturing all the way. It's not MFG, so it's Lake Country Manufacturing. It's like um, the longest IG handle you've ever seen, but <laughs> at least you can remember what it is because it's the name of our company. Um, I think Facebook and Instagram and everywhere is all the same there. So okay. yeah, pretty much just check us out on our on our website, we'll have some some new products launching um, in January. Obviously, yeah. the pad washer and, and some other items, and uh, some more in February. Yeah, all the tools and the Udo's pads are available now at online retailers. Um, you guys are going to start carrying some of them, mm -hmm. and then look for the pad washer and a couple of, couple other new pad uh, products um, come come the new year. All right. There you go. Okay. Excellent. Bye, Thanks. And then wrapping us up, Kirby Thompson says, thanks, Dave and Andrew, for all you shared today. So thank, thank you, you much, much for that. All right, guys. So wrapping this up, it's yet another day in the books for TRCMA. That is right. And uh, we've got one day left. And there are some surprises in store for tomorrow. Obviously, I can't reveal everything just yet. But we got G Technic starting us off there in the morning, followed by Koenig with G Technic and Justin Pate of the Rap Institute with G Technic, as well as MTM with a phone cannon demo. And, well, there's a special announcement coming up right there at the end. So there's a lot to look forward to tomorrow. All right, guys? So if you're looking for any details, obviously, check out trcma.com that has all of our vendors, all the links, some product information, and a whole lot more schedule, all that links to the live streams. You get the idea. Everything you're looking for is at trcma.com, and tomorrow is the final day. So stick with us, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful night. All right, till next time, see you.